Hi, my name is Ken Murray. I'm a CICD engineer at IBM, uh, working within the Cloud Pack for Watson AI Ops team. Uh, my area of expertise is in the adoption of GitOps in the development and operation of deployment pipelines. Uh, today, I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Ying Mo, uh, to present on the topic of GitOps and Crossplane and its application across uh, both traditional um, non-cloud native IT environments and cloud native applications. Uh, so an overview of the agenda. Um, first stage here, I'm going to talk about the adoption of Crossplane and Argo CD um, in CI/CD pipelines. Um, I'm going to give a generic view of a deployment pipeline um, as it exists today and, and, and how we use um, our, our deployment pipelines in the uh, infrastructure provisioning and uh, lifecycle management, but also in application deployments. I'm um, going to talk about Crossplane um, as an abstraction platform for infrastructure provisioning. So basically using GitOps to both manage um, our infrastructure and, and also application deployments. Uh, Yingmo um, will then uh, discuss uh, ongoing development work in, in the area of uh, Ansible Crossplane provider um, for more traditional um, IT systems. Um, he'll discuss the, the provider in terms of, of how it works and, and how people can use it and how it can be adopted. Um, and, and then finally a deep dive uh, across, the, uh, across the Ansible uh, provider runtime lifecycle, uh, some best practices um, in, the, in the use of, uh, of the provider. Um, and then finally comparing the, the Ansible provider with the, uh, the Ansible operator. Um, so if we just look at a typical deployment pipeline, a very generic view, um, you typically would have a build here coming in on the left-hand side of the deployment pipeline. Um, the first stage would typically be the acquisition of infrastructure onto which you would run your deployments. Um, the second stage uh, would typically be some kind of configuration you might want to do on that infrastructure. So in terms of a Kubernetes cluster, for example, you might want to set up some storage or some prerequisites um, before you do your application deployment. Um, application deployment, then you would deploy your, your, your software components onto that infrastructure. Um, you may want to do some post deploy checks um, to ensure that the, you know, your applications have got are deployed to a sufficient level before you would trigger some downstream test pipelines. Um, you may want to export some deployment logs, um, trigger then downstream test pipelines, um, export those uh, test pipeline results to some um, location that could be you know, downloaded by in individuals at a later point. Um, and then finally, uh, you may want to do some notification um, out to the wider teams that you know, your deployments have, have completed. Uh, the stages in such a pipeline that would be typically, as, as I call it, GitOps ready, um, would be those that would be more typical um, to application deployment and, and uh, you know, the application of Kubernetes manifests right onto, onto a cluster. So in terms of this generic pipeline view here, we could look at perhaps configuration application deployment being more typical to um, the typical you know, view of GitOps um, and, and the application of GitOps. Infrastructure management in particular would, would not be applicable as it stands today with, to GitOps. Um, infrastructure management typically involves the use of um, custom infrastructure APIs. Okay, so provisioning of infrastructure, you would typically point to that infrastructure provider's um, APIs to create um, those, those, those environments, um, which typically don't lend themselves quite well to um, the adoption of GitOps. Um, so infrastructure provisioning and lifecycle management, then if we just focus a little bit in on the infrastructure um, section of our pipeline, acquiring the infrastructure. Um, today, um, what we do in our pipelines is that we maintain um, a pool of Kubernetes clusters. Um, so this pool is available for deployment uh, at any time. Um, it, it speeds up the, our, our complete deployment lifecycle in a sense that we, we have clusters prepared um, be, before they're actually needed for deployment. So we maintain um, a set of pre-provisioned clusters um, in a pool. Um, when we request a cluster from our deployment pipeline, we go to our pool manager and it, it basically picks a cluster um, available for, for the deployment pipeline. Um, our pool manager then also uh, tops up that pool, so it, it communicates via um, uh, custom APIs to um, IBM's infrastructure provider to, to create um, clusters. 
So in this case, we're using Red Hat um, OpenShift uh, clusters. Um, so we, we communicate with our infrastructure provider over their APIs to, to create a cluster at, at a particular config level. Um, and, and it's placed into our pool um, ready, for, ready for deployment at a later stage. Um, so as I said, the pool manager is, is set at a provisioned level, right? So we have a set level um, of, of X number of clusters we need um, for our deployment pipeline. Um, it supports variation in cluster specifications, right? So different um, specifications of our worker nodes, for example, um, you know, CPU memory um, and, and storage. Um, and the key point here, I guess, is that the infrastructure, the interface to the infrastructure provider um, is, is custom interface, right? It's, it's non-cloud native. Um, so it, it quite interesting if we could think of infrastructure uh, management like we do application management, um, could we you know, adopt and, and leverage the benefits of GitOps um, and span that across both infrastructure and, and application uh, deployment? So with the, uh, the use of Crossplane, we can achieve just that. Um, Crossplane provides uh, an, abstra an abstraction platform um, for infrastructure provisioning. Um, so we have rolled out um, uh, a provider for our, 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 for our infrastructure um, uh, management um, Crossplane provider. Um, it's, it defines uh, a cluster as a very simple um, resource type. Um, so the, the complexities of managing um, our clusters for, for our end users are, is really masked, um, masked to, to, to our users. Uh, they don't need to be aware of the, the API specification. They just need to you know, be aware of, of, of the kind of type of cluster and the configuration of the cluster within the uh, OCP resource, the OpenShift uh, platform resource definition here on, on the left-hand side. So you can see here, we specify things like the cluster name, the, the version of the OpenShift um, we, we want to provision, uh, things like the site, um, what data center we want that cluster to be deployed into, and then uh, some very you know, high level um, configuration for the workers within the cluster. Um, so the user basically just needs to populate out these parameters here, and the provider communicates across to our cloud provider to, um, to provision the cluster. Um, the provider also provides the cluster endpoint and credentials then written to um, secrets on our control plane cluster. So the control plane is essentially um, our cluster running uh, Argo CD. Um, so it is our, our master cluster for that, that basically performs the, um, the provisioning of our infrastructure and run, running of our deployment pipeline as well. Um, as with any type of, you know, Kubernetes uh, resource type, we get status um, uh, again via um, the provider back onto the OCP resources. So um, on our control plane cluster, we can list all the clusters we've got deployed in our pool and, and get the status of those as we would with any other um, type, uh, Kubernetes resource type. Um, so in the definition of um, our resources then for cross plane, we're using Helm. Um, Helm provides um, a very good mechanism by which we can um, override and set configurations um, uh, for our clusters. Um, so the template basically allows for the passing of um, customized attributes um, for, our, for our cluster deployment. So here on the left hand side, for example, you can see we're taking default values um, from a values file. Um, but we're then also taking um, like the attributes like the cluster name, um, we're overriding those um, to, to create the, the overall um, OCP definition. And we'll see that on the next slide. Um, so here we can see the default values um, for our clusters. So this will be in one particular cluster pool type. This pool type is, is basically holding clusters of um, OCP 4.10.3 um, in site XYZ. Um, and this is the default configuration for the, the workers. The cluster pool YAML then is basically overriding the cluster name each time it, it creates um, a new instance or a new cluster instance in our pool. So when we want to create another cluster, we essentially just add another line um, here into our cluster pool YAML. Um, and, and that then uh, merges with the named template uh, to produce the overall um, uh, cluster instance here uh, on the far right hand side. So how can we uh, bring this together then um, to manage infrastructure and applications using GitOps? 
Um, so this is uh, kind of just a high level view of, of the flows then. Um, if we start with GitHub, uh, GitHub on, on the left-hand side, um, on the, 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 blue, the blue kind of trend here, we're, we're looking at the default uh, values coming in for the clusters, our cluster pool YAML, which defines the instances of the, the clusters that we want to you know, exist in our pool. Um, as I said in the previous slide, that's merged with the named template, and it basically roots through Argo CD, which syncs off of the Git repository holding those um, artifacts um, through the provider um, and a post request across to our infrastructure um, uh, provider to generate the clusters in the pool. Um, so if we want to, as I said in the previous slide, if we want to create clusters, we uh, essentially just add a new cluster entry into the cluster pool YAML. And similarly, if we want to delete a cluster, it just gets removed from that cluster pool YAML. Um, and Argo CD detects the update um, or the commit um, to, to, to representing that removal or addition of a cluster and, and, and reconciles that um, via the cross-plane provider um, onto our cluster pool. Um, application deployment then, um, again, you, you know, cloud native, right? So it's using the traditional um, cloud native path here. We have our values.yaml, um, again, Helm, Helm driven. Um, our application templates, which, you know, contains all of the, the templates for our application deployment. Um, and that follows the green line, uh, which essentially is, again, syncing off of um, GitHub, our GitHub repository for application deployment through Argo CD, and this time straight on to the uh, cluster that's chosen for deployment. So um, as I said, at the, at, towards the start of the presentation, um, our, our deployment pipeline will choose a cluster from the pool for um, a particular deployment run, uh, and that becomes the active cluster then for, the, for deployment. Um, so we, we deploy straight onto that cluster, uh, again, using uh, Argo, Argo CD. Um, so some of the benefits of, of doing it this way, right? So managing both infrastructure and applications uh, using GitOps, um, we have a common approach. Um, so we, we leverage the same uh, Argo CD approach um, for both managing our infrastructure. So you can think of infrastructure as code. Um, it's, it's managed and, and maintained uh, within GitHub. Um, some of the benefits there, obviously, right, with, with, with anything, I suppose, in, in GitHub is that we've, we've got it versioned and audited. Um, we've got an audit trail of when clusters get created and, and, and removed from our pool. Um, single source is true, of course, um, for deployment infrastructure. Um, it avoids configuration drift. Okay, so when we look at our cluster pools, we know definitively that those clusters um, map back to our definition within, within GitHub. Um, there can be no configuration drift um, in, in a sense of, of, of individuals creating clusters and placing them in the pool that may, um, you know, contravene our, our, our configuration uh, templates for those clusters in that given pool. Um, cluster state is continuously reconciled. Um, and this is an important aspect. Um, if clusters get inadvertently deleted from our pool, um, you know, Argo CD will see that. Um, and it will detect the change and it will drive um, the, the, the cluster pool back to its defined state as per, as per GitHub. Um, so again, that's a very important characteristic for us, uh, not, not only in terms of application management and to ensure that your applications are mapping back to the single source of truth, but obviously also for our infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Ying Mo now, um, and, and Ying Mo is going to discuss um, some ongoing work um, in the development of an Ansible provider. Um, again, uh, more focused on, you know, the, the mapping uh, GitOps across to uh, traditional IT systems. Um, so again, continuing on with, you know, applying the the concepts of Argo CD and and, and crossplane uh, to the, the non-cloud native world. Um, so so over to you, um, Ying Mo. Thanks, Ken. So my name is Mo Ying, and I'm from IBM as a software engineer. Next, I'm going to share with you how Argo CD can be extended to reach traditional IT system by leveraging CrossPlan. So a little bit background. As we all know, both Argo CD and CrossPlan are designed for cloud native, and it can only be run in Kubernetes. However, this may not be true for many real-world organizations where they may have IT systems that are traditional-based, such as application run on VM 
or bare metal. And they may have already heavily invested on management automation for those kind of systems. For management automation, Ansible as a popular automation technology has a large user base and mature ecosystem. It is widely adopted by many of such organizations to automate the management for different varieties of IT systems ranging from cloud native to non-cloud native. So the question here is how we can drive GitOps for those systems consistently, no matter it is cloud native or non-cloud native. Here, I'd like to introduce an open source project that is currently working in progress, the cross pen provider for Ansible. It is targeted to extend the cross pen scope by enabling its integration with Ansible to build a bridge between the cloud native and non-cloud native world. So that can open a door to drive and reuse existing automation assets to manage hybrid technologies using the same way consistently and help organizations transition to cloud native while keep their existing investments. Let's take a quick look at how it looks. So this is a diagram uh, that illustrates how Ansible provider works at a high level. Basically, Ansible provider is driven at its core by a Kubernetes controller called Ansible Run Controller, where it watches the Ansible Run Kubernetes customer resource along with a reference to the provider config that includes all the information to run Ansible contents. The controller usually retrieves the Ansible contents remotely from many places such as uh, Ansible Galaxy, Automation Hub, or Git Repo. And then it will store the content into a working directory so that can be launched by a um, embedded Ansible runner command line. So here are some examples to demonstrate how to use it. For example, we can define an Ansible run um, to call an Ansible row or an Ansible playbook. And both of them are usually retrieved from a remote place, which can be defined as the requirements in the provided config. So as it is shown here, um, this one is retrieved from um, Ansible Galaxy, and this one is retrieved from a Git repo. And if it is a private Git repo that requires credential to access, we can also define the credentials information here. We can also pass variables to customize the Ansible run like this. And for some simple cases, we can even define an inline playbook directly within the Ansible run resource, which does not require any remote retrieval. Next, let's take a little bit deep dive into the Ansible provider design so that you can better understand what happens inside the provider. First, Let's take a quick look at how CrossPen Provider manages its resource. So to manage resource, or usually we call it external resource on targeted system, it requires us to define managed resource that includes the desired state and is watched by the CrossPen managed resource reconciler on local system. To manage the external resource, we will have to operate on the managed resource where the changes will be detected by the managed resource reconciler. Then the reconciler will operate on the external resource on target system to reflect the changes that we made on the managed resource. To be more accurate, this is a typical reconciliation loop that is consistent, uh, consists of five phases. 
it starts from the connect phase that is usually um, used to, to establish the connection to the targeted system. Then observe, delete, create, and update that map to the resource CRUD operations. During the observe phase, the provider will usually detect if the resource on target system exists or not. If it does not exist, it will advance to the create phase um, to create the resource. And if it does exist but not up to date, it will then go to the update phase to update the resource so that the desired state and the actual state are always in sync. Once it's finished, it will requeue um, to wait for the next loop. And if user deletes the managed resource, that means we will never need external resource on targeted system anymore. Then this will trigger um, the delete phase where the provider will help us delete the resource on targeted system. So this is what we call as cross plan managed resource lifecycle. Now um, it turns to the Ansible run lifecycle. You may see that it is actually a subset of the cross plan managed resource lifecycle. Generally, um, in Ansible provider, there are two types of lifecycle for the Ansible run that are supported. In the first type, the provider uses observe to handle the case when the managed resource Ansible run is present and use delete to handle the case when the managed resource Ansible run is absent. And both observe and delete will call the same set of Ansible contents. In the second type, the provider will run the Ansible contents in observe first, but using the check mode, which is essentially a dry run. And if any change is detected after the dry run, the provider will then trigger create or update to kick off the actual run of the same set of Ansible contents. Also, um, both two types will use connect to prepare the runtime environment for the Ansible run, for example, to retrieve the Ansible contents from a remote place. Okay, now you learned how Ansible run will be driven by following the lifecycle. Ansible provider implements the lifecycle to decide when to run the Ansible. But in order to um, do the actual work to manage the resource on target system, it relies on the Ansible contents. Now let's see what are the best practices for Ansible users who create the Ansible contents so that can align with the life cycle much better. So here are a couple of rules. The first rule is to keep your Ansible rules or playbooks Adapted. It is always a best practice to write Ansible rules or playbooks in an adapted way. For Ansible provider, this is required because the same Ansible contents will be run many times in the reconciliation loop. You should guarantee that each Ansible run should produce the same results if the desired state is not changed. The second rule is to ensure your Ansible rules or playbooks to support state field. It is also a common practice in many Ansible modules that support state field and behave differently according to the state value. And for Ansible provider, this is required because the same Ansible contents will be used to handle both the case when the Ansible run resource is present and absent. Next, let's take a quick look at the difference between Ansible provider and Ansible operator, which is another similar technology created by a Red Hat that can bring Ansible into Kubernetes world. <laughs> 
So as it listed here, uh, there are a few major differences. First, Ansible operator is mainly designed for managing Kubernetes resources, while Ansible provider can be used to manage both Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes resources. Um, second, Ansible operator requires you um, to bundle Ansible contents that manage resource into a container image at build time before you deploy it. And Ansible provider on the other side works as a driver without having to build Ansible contents into it, but instead to prepare and call those Ansible contents at runtime. And third, Ansible operator is usually implemented um, as a co-located Kubernetes application to operate on in-cluster resources. While Ansible provider usually runs on one Kubernetes cluster, then operates on the resources on another remote system, which can be either Kubernetes or non-Kubernetes. Lastly, all the discussions around the Ansible provider was extracted from the design doc, which I put the link here just for your reference. You can read it to get a more detailed version. And since it is an open source project that is evolving rapidly, I would encourage you to join us and feel free to open Git issue or submit PR if you have any good idea on how to improve it. Okay, that's all for this session and thanks for watching.